Good morning and welcome to this, the second meeting of the Equality and Human Rights Committee in 2018. Can I make the usual request that mobile devices are switched to silent or switched off and off desks, please? Um, our first agenda item this morning is an oral evidence uh, taking session with witnesses on prisoner voting. Uh, today our focus is on the experience of prisoner voting in other jurisdictions and I'd like to welcome to committee this morning Dr Cormac Behan who is a lecturer in criminology at the University of Sheffield. Good, good morning Dr Behan and thank you so much for your written evidence. Good morning, thank you for the invitation. Okay. And with us also is Emma Trottier who is the former public servant with the Correctional Services of Canada and the Canadian Department of Public Safety. Uh, good morning Emma and thank you so much for your evidence uh, to us. Uh, Preceding the meeting too. Good morning. Thank good, you for having good, me. Good morning. And I'm going to start by asking uh, the first question. And I think um, it's a general question, uh, really about where, uh, in both the jurisdictions that, that you both have been involved in, um, the the process that you went through to get to where you are. And I know it's slightly different for both both Ireland and Canada. But uh, Dr. Behan, if I can start with you, if you could give us an understanding of the Irish example and, and how it got to where it, it got to. Okay, so I suppose the Irish example was somewhat unique in that prior to the enfranchisements on prisoners, there was no law in the statute book which actually debarred prisoners from voting. It was simply that they couldn't access polling stations on the day of elections or referenda, etc. So there was no legislation to actually re be repealed to enable prisoners to vote. And in a uh, court case in the early 2000s, the Supreme Court said that prisoners still were entitled to vote under the 1992 Electoral Act. However, there was no facility to allow them to vote. However, they said if an individual happened to be on temporary release on the day of an election, and they were registered in their home constituency, they were still entitled and legally uh, entitled to exercise their franchise. In 2006, in response to the Hearst judgment, which I'm sure many on the committee are familiar with, the Irish government decided to introduce legislation to enfranchise prisoners for a number of reasons. There was some discussion about whether there would be a case brought through the domestic courts and possibly up to the European court to allow prisoners to vote or to uh, force the government to introduce legislation. So preemptively, the government decided to introduce legislation. They introduced legislation in an electoral act in 2006. And when they did, they introduced legislation to enfranchise all prisoners, regardless of sentence and regardless of their crime, which was uh, quite wide, obviously, in its uh, impact and its, its effect. When that happened then, the first election took place in 2007, but what was, I think, somewhat unique about the Irish experience is the lack of controversy surrounding the discussions and surrounding the actual debates in Parliament. In the first instance, in both houses in Parliament, in the Dáil, the Lower House, and the Shannon, the Upper House, no member of Parliament spoke against this, no member voted against it, and much of the discussion in the uh, parliamentary debates were about the mechanics of how it happens, and to try, there was an argument that prisoners should be encouraged, should be enabled and encouraged to vote to uh, engender a sense of responsibility. One or two other kind of key aspects of it, I would think, is there was no media opposition. In my research, I found only one reference in a national newspaper to the actual debates, and that's when the legislation was actually passed. That's in stark contrast, for example, to the research I've done in the United Kingdom, where the media have tended to report on this as a matter of uh, acute controversy and generally have come down against uh, allowing prisoners to vote. Other element which I think was important was it was introduced as an electoral reform. It was introduced by the Minister of the Environment and Local Government rather than a penal reform or a criminal justice reform. So it was put forward as an idea to modernise the electoral system. And I suppose in contrast to what happened in the United Kingdom, there was a much more positive uh, outlook and much more positive idea about the concept of Europe. In the United Kingdom, especially in England, uh, in the Westminster Parliament, it has been caught up in the debates about Europe, uh, even though 
It's the European Convention and the European Court of Human Rights, which is not the European Union. It has just been caught up in the general milieu and debates around the actual uh, impact and the uh, powers of the European Union and European, what was considered European interference. So I think there was a number of kind of key elements there that distinguish it from other jurisdictions and enabled what was, in reality, a very minor piece of amending legislation but made a major impact in terms of enfranchising all prisoners regardless of sentence or crime. Okay, thank you. It's interesting points, and I'll come back to some of them, I, I think. Emma, if, if you could explain to us the, the Canada situation, because it's similar to the situation here, and as much as it's a court order that's, that's uh, precipitated the change. Um, if I could first, I, I want to explain the division in Canada's correctional system, because it's important to the story. So Canada's correctional system is divided in two ways. First, where a sentence of imprisonment in, is imposed, there's a dividing line that's set at two years. So if you're serving a sentence of two years less a day, you're sent to a prison. And if you're sentenced to two years or more, you're sentenced to a penitentiary. And prisons are managed by our provincial and territorial governments, whereas sentences of two years or more are managed by the federal government. And that becomes important as I go on about the court challenges. Um, Quebec was the first province in Canada to allow its prisoners, its provincial prisoners, to vote, and that was in 1979. Um, it only permitted um, prisoners to vote in provincial elections, but it disbarred um, prisoners who were serving a sentence for violating the Elections Act from voting. The next stage of the story is in 1982 when the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into force. And what that is, is it's part two of our Constitution. Um, what that did, what the Charter did, what the Constitution did, was it set out in Section 3 that every citizen has the right to vote. And what happened was that some provinces in Canada, after the Charter came into force, uh, allowed prisoners to vote. So. Um, Manitoba and Newfoundland joined Quebec in allowing prisoners to vote. But what that did was it created disparity across Canada. Um, voting, at least for prisoners, was dependent on um, where you were incarcerated, the length of your sentence, and what type of election it was, so provincial versus federal. Um, two years after the Charter came into force, uh, a prisoner called Rick Sauvé, who was serving a lengthy sentence, um, introduced what we call a charter challenge, so a constitutional challenge to the prisoner voting ban. And it wasn't until 1993 that the Supreme Court of Canada ruled um, that the total ban on prisoner voting was unconstitutional. That same year, the Canadian Parliament, so the federal government, um, introduced a bill, which was passed by Parliament, that removed the disqualification for prisoners serving sentences of two years less a day, but it maintained the ban on federal prisoners, so those serving two years or more. The new provision um, that kept the ban on federal prisoners from voting was challenged again by Rick Sauvé. Um, and it wasn't until 2002, so it took almost 10 years for, it, um, for the case to make its way through Canadian courts, um, for it to reach the Supreme Court of Canada again. And again, the Supreme Court of Canada found that the legislation um, infringing on prisoners' right to vote was not a reasonable limit um, of that right. And if um, I can go into it more if you're interested on why the Supreme Court uh, ruled that, but it was also included in my uh, written evidence. So since 2002, all prisoners in Canada have the right to vote, and their first um, vote in a federal election happened in 2004. Oh, there's loads of questions in here, and I know that the, the, the rest of the, the, the committee have got <coughs> lots of questions, but I was very struck by the fact in both examples that all prisoners ha have, have the right to vote, and uh, the UK government have proposals um, for uh, the rest of the UK, uh, 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 apart from Scotland, um, 
on where they will go with the judgment that was passed on them and it's the, the most minimal um, amount that they would do and it's only if you happen to be out of prison on the day that there's, there's an election that, that that would happen. Was that a consideration in uh, both the, the circumstances in Canada and Ireland or was it as Dr Behan described that there wasn't really a lot of debate here, all prisoners were getting the vote and it was about how do we facilitate people getting the vote, is that, is that the way it worked Dr Behan? Yes, I suppose it begins with a philosophical belief in whether you want to give prisoners the right to vote. And certainly in the Republic of Ireland, the debates around that seem to be if we're going to enfranchise prisoners or enable them more than enfranchise them, because legally they still had the right to vote, although they couldn't exercise it on election day. So we're going to enable them to vote. It was more about the mechanics of how we're going to do it rather than the debates about which... Have, which have happened in other jurisdictions, who should be allowed to vote? Should it be related to sentence or should it be related to crime? But the discussions in Ireland was very much about the practicalities. How is this going to actually be uh, not just enacted but facilitated within the prison itself? That was through postal voting? Yes, what happened was is the legislation enabled prisoners to vote by way of postal voting. So they just added another section of postal voting uh, to the constituencies. So, for example, there's postal voting for people who are infirm and can't make it to an election or are out of the country on diplomatic business, etc. There's six different types of postal voters, and this was just another uh, category of postal votes. Okay. Emma, given that the two uh, tier system uh, uh, with the two years less a day and two years plus a day situation, was there a consideration there about whether length of sentence or crime? It should be taken into account and whether people get the right to vote. But obviously Canada came down on the side of all people getting the right to vote mm -hmm. eventually. Yeah, eventually it took about 10 years. Um, but yes, even though the decision had come out in 1993 that the decision to the you know blanket ban on voting was unconstitutional, um, the federal government chose to, or as we would say in Canada, the government tried to comply with the court ruling but still chose to maintain the ban on two years or more, um, which the court in 2002 found was an arbitrary um, decision. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just go to open questions. Mary, do you want to come in first? Uh, can I uh, just pick up on something that, that, that both of you um, have, have said, and, and it's about um, how the public perceived the decision to give the prisoners um, the, the vote. Be because um, th there has been a, a fair amount of discussion and debate um, across the, the UK um, about whether or not prisoners should have the right to vote. Um, and, and people come down very much on one side or the other. There's either a no, absolutely not, or a yes. And there is a, a very kind of slight grey area in, in, in the middle. And I'm just interested in why both of you think, particularly um, Dr Behan, why <coughs> it's so uncontroversial. Um, in, in, in Ireland, I mean, the media in this country, as you probably be aware, uh, there are there are certain media um, outlets in this country that take a very particular view on um, offenders that, and portray them in a particular way. Uh, and I'd be interested whether um, that was the same in both Ireland and, and Canada, and, and how the public got on board with this. Okay, I suppose what was remarkable, I think, about my research that I found in the Republic of Ireland was the lack of discussion and lack of debate outside of the parliament itself. There was, I did a uh, analysis of six different newspapers, some of which would take a, the popular press, that are Irish editions of the popular press, that would take a different line here. They were, this discussion wasn't even mentioned in those newspapers in the Republic of Ireland. In only one newspaper was there in the parliamentary report of the actual passing of legislation. It began in October 2006 and through the committee stages, etc., it was finally passed in December 2006. And it was just a small report saying this, this has actually been passed. The lack of uh, controversy has struck me in terms of I've lived in the United Kingdom now for the last six and a half years and looking at how newspapers and the kind of discourse around it has actually been framed is very very different. I would say one of the issues here in the United Kingdom has been a kind of perfect storm of a law and order issue 
along with what's seen as or argued to be European interference or judicial activism. And all of these coming together seem to be, have created a much greater controversy than, for example, in the Republic of Ireland, where it was introduced as an electoral rather than a penal justice or a penal reform or criminal justice reform. And therefore, there wasn't the same, I suppose, debates around the kind of punitive approach there might be in terms of the treatment of prisoners in the Republic of Ireland uh, than in uh, the United Kingdom. And remarkably, nobody spoke against, no parliamentarian spoke out against the uh, uh, legislation, whereas in the House of Commons there was, have been debates and backbench debates where Parliament has said it's a matter for the UK Parliament alone and not for anybody else to decide, and they came down on the side that the legislation as it exists should uh, be uh, stay as it exists. Now, I know there has been some developments just at the end of last year where the Secretary of State for Justice has introduced very minimal uh, and limited uh, voting for a very, very small number of prisoners in response to the Hearst judgment. Um, Emma, just before you come in, can I come back to the point you made about electoral reform? Do you think we need to find a way then in the, in the UK to change the discussion because the discussion at the moment is centred quite firmly that it that it's a justice issue, mm -hmm. that it's penal reform. We need to change that that discourse and discussion to move it to electoral reform, and that will change the way people perceive it. I think. I think it reflects two things. I think, first of all, it probably reflects the much wider debates about the attitudes towards prisoners and people who commit crime in the United Kingdom, and therefore, to bring that to a more rational discussion about how we treat people, what's effective, how we deal with prisoners, how we encourage them to reintegrate into society afterwards, how we encourage them to participate in a community within prison and maintain their connection with society outside. So I think there's that issue. I think the other thing is, I would argue as a student of politics and history, is that we should encourage all citizens to participate as widely as possible in democratic dialogue. So therefore, if we uh, facilitate as wide a number of people as possible in through electoral reform, that that creates a more vibrant democratic state and democ opportunity for people to civically engage. Because if you look at the research around uh, voting, it indicates that those who vote are more likely to be civically involved in many other areas. They look at everything from charitable effects to community groups to parent-teacher associations, etc. that there is a connection now. Whether one leads to the other, there's some discussion about that. But certainly, it does engender a sense of civic engagement and civic responsibility. And that is enabled by electoral change. The discussion around criminal justice issues and treatments of prisoners is bigger issues that I think need to be discussed as well. Okay. Emma, what was the situation in Canada? How did the public perceive this? Um, well, I should say that I only know from having spoken to um, fellow Canadians that are far more knowledgeable in this area than I am, because at the time that this happened, I was um, quite young, um, so don't remember it firsthand. But what I can say is that some of the concerns that came out uh, from the public was that um, that because of where institutions were and how populated they were, so I think our biggest facility is about 500 uh, prisoners, that it would sway uh, that riding in one direction or the other. Um, another concern was that, oh, right, we've given them the right to vote, but they're not going to use it, they're not going to vote, um, and that it would be too difficult um, and time-consuming to facilitate voting in all of the prisons and penitentiaries across Canada. And all of those concerns that were raised um, in 1993 and again in 2002 have have never materialized, um, in part because of the way that we've structured um, elections for um, prisoners in Canada. So they don't vote in the riding of their penitentiary or prison, they vote in their home riding. Um, there's evidence that suggests that prisoners vote um, almost in equal numbers uh, as to the rest of Canadians in the general population. Um, and in terms of being too difficult or time consuming, uh, we've learned through the last few federal elections we've had that it actually isn't um, that difficult to make it happen because Elections Canada holds polling stations in all of our prisons and penitentiaries.
That's interesting. Can I just ask a follow-up question about um, take-up of voting? Because that's another argument that, that we, we have heard um, used here, that if you give prisoners the, the, um, the vote, none of them will use it because they wouldn't be interested. So the, the point you make about um, take-up of, of, of voting is it, much the same as in the wider population. It, it's very interesting. I'd be interested in um, Dr Behan's um, view on that. And, and the other point that has been made is, well, are you going to have hustings in prisons? Are you going to set up polling stations in prisons? And, and I tend to think it's people that just don't want prisoners to have the right to vote are putting up in some cases, quite ridiculous obstacles to why th th they shouldn't vote. So, uptake of voting in Ireland, was it very high? Well, in the first election in 2007, 14% of the, popula uh, the prison population registered and 10% overall voted. So, it was about 75% of the registered population actually went out to vote. It has been quite low at that time. That, this was the first time, and obviously there would be uh, maybe teething problems the first time it actually happening for both electoral officials and, pr and prison officials. It has been generally under 10% uh, since then because I've conducted research on a number of elections since then. I would say that the prisoner population voting reflects the demographic of the people outside. Generally in the Republic of Ireland, those who are sent to prison are young, urban males with low level of traditional educational attainment and they tend to have low levels of trust, low levels of civic engagement and low levels of voting outside. So it's probably not surprising that that demographic which is uh, predominantly represented in the prison population, so once they get to prison they don't necessarily uh, uh, change their uh, patterns. What has happened is, is that those who are most likely to vote, in my research I found, are those who have voted before, those who have a higher level of trust in civic institutions, those who uh, have greater levels of education. So if you look at the demographic inside of those who vote, it reflects the demographic outside of those who vote, or indeed vice versa, who don't. I think the debates are a twofold. Number one is whether there is a belief that prisoners should be entitled to vote, and then if that, if you go down that road, or you believe it shouldn't, but if you believe prisoners should have the right to it, then there's the practicalities. And, you know, prisons are flexible institutions in ways that they respond to different changes in uh, penal policy over time. And in the Republic of Ireland, what happened was the prisoners were given their ballot, it was organized by the local electoral authorities. They were given their ballot paper. It was put into a, uh, another envelope. That envelope was then uh, signed, and it was a, a kind of mini, what would you say, polling booth was set up within each prison. It wasn't a huge uh, onerous task on the prison authorities. I think, secondly, why not have hustings in prisons? Why not go to prisons and find out what prisoners actually think? We do it with every other area of engagement today. I'm in a university, we talk to students. The health service, we talk to patients. We talk to the constituencies which are involved in uh, any, whether it's services we provide. And therefore, I would encourage politicians, yes, to go into prisons, have hustings in prisons, engage prisoners, and put it up to them that they have a responsibility also to participate in the elections as a form of civic engagement. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Thank you for coming to see us today. I find your opening presentations fascinating. I think we've got a great panel here because we've got two examples, uh, a country where there was an outright disqualification on prisoner voting and a country which, very like Britain, didn't have a stated disqualification of voting. It was more, I think it's fair to say that the UK and Ireland mirrored each other in the sense there was this antiquated Victorian notion of civic death on incarceration that you just didn't participate in the normal run of hum human life in the country that you inhabit while you were incarcerated um, so but I'm really also interested in the the disparity though that exists between Britain and Ireland in the fact that um, we have a hugely un, uh, uh, hostile press to the idea of civic uh, or, or voting for prisoners and I think that 
that hostile right-wing press is the same hostile right-wing press that um, doesn't see prison as a means of rehabilitation. It sees it as a, a punishment. It, it talks up the fact that we, we give luxuries to prisoners in, in prisons, and, and they hold the public to a certain degree in their thrall. So um, first question to Dr. Bahan. Um, Ireland managed to do this because I don't think you, st you have that culture. You don't have that Europhobic... Um, prisoner bashing right-wing media that we have in the UK, so you had an easier run. Um, are there international examples of countries which have brought this in against the tide of public opinion as we face in the United Kingdom? I think it's up to uh, private newspapers or private uh, media to decide on their perspectives, and then I suppose politicians to either respond, take that on board, but it, I haven't come across any jurisdictions where there has been a public backlash against prisoner voting and politicians introduced this legislation uh, in spite of that. So I think what has happened is, is that in the jurisdictions that it has actually been introduced, many times it has been the judiciary that have kind of forced the issue and have kind of pushed it and governments have, have, have responded to that. It's in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, as you say, there are somewhat unique characteristics, but I think it reflects maybe a different and less punitive approach to the treatment of prisoners, to what we expect from uh, the institutions when, when we send them to prison. And it really comes down, down to what are the objectives of punishment and what do we expect from prison? And if we expect prison to exclude people, to contain people, to take them out of society for a period of time, generally they do that fairly well. They generally you know, can achieve that goal. But if we want prisons to be a place where people have an opportunity for reflection, for the potential for change and for transformation, then I would look at it and argue that enabling prisoners to participate as widely as possible in society outside might be what uh, resistance scholars call one of the hooks for change, where people begin to see that, yes, on election day, every individual's vote is the same. Every individual is equal on election day, and therefore, if prisoners are given that opportunity, it's one of what I would consider as a kind of wider mosaic of citizenship to encourage prisoners to participate and to see their role as contributing to society and giving something back, as well as having responsibilities. They also have obligations and can contribute to society both inside, and that might engender a sense of commitment to lead a kind of pro-social law-abiding life outside. Thank you. Emma, um, in terms of Canada, the blanket disqualification, when was that originally brought in? Well, it wasn't... Um, it depends if you look at provincial versus federal. So in the 70s, you had Quebec, which was the only province that allowed it, um, 1979. And before that, we're going all the way back to 1869. So the legislation is Victorian? Or, yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Well, where we got it from was... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, absolutely. Um, and I was fascinated to hear that you, the only backlash was a concern over the process. Um, uh, since the uh, ban was relaxed or, or removed, um, has, the, uh, has it been a feature of discussion in the Canadian press? It, so every time we come up to a federal election, there is always something in the CBC News, um, which is the Canadian equivalent of the BBC News, um, about... Uh, prisoners going to the polls because it happens 10 days before the election day for the remainder of Canada. But it's a very neutral article um, highlighting that Elections Canada officials are going into prisons across the country to facilitate um, prisoners' right to vote. Thank you. And in respect of the uh, process, the democratic involvement of prisoners when they are so enfranchised, I mean, we talked about hustings in prisons, and I, I fully support that, and I, I absolutely support the idea of extending the franchise. Um, do you think that there is, a, a, or have you seen evidence, either in the jurisdictions that you're representing or other jurisdictions that have extended the franchises to prisoners, of that decision then shaping public policy towards penal reform, that when politicians go into hustings, um, they may see, f for the first time, the visceral detail of the penitential system and, and thereby seek to, to try and woo the prison population through their manifestos, as it were? 
Um, you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I can't say. I know that we do have politicians or candidates that go into um, penitentiaries and prisons in the run-up to elections and do hold meetings um, with prisoners um, while they're incarcerated. I don't know if that has shaped um, candidates' perceptions of our conditions of confinement. I would wager that it does, given that some of them are quite harsh, um, but I can't, I can't say with any certainty. And final follow-up on that, if I may, convener, is that um, I, whilst, I mean, you answered very eloquently, uh, Emma, the, the argument that uh, the vote of 500 prisoners in one uh, penitentiary could sway an election in a riding, but obviously if they're voting postally for their, their, uh, their ridings from which they come from, that that will just be the diffuse effect of voting and they, their votes will count along with all their neighbours. Um, in that respect, um, is it harder for those prisoners to engage in the democratic process because their candidate might be in a riding se several hundred miles from where they're incarcerated. So um, are there means of prisoners engaging with the process remotely? I do think, um, having worked for the Correctional Service Canada during um, a federal election, that it does make every effort to um, inform prisoners so that they receive you know, web-based information um, as much as it can be facilitated. Um, they have access to television so they can watch on the news what's being said um, in their respective writings. So I do think every effort is made to ensure that they have the information to make an informed decision on their vote. If I could pass the same question to Dr. Bahan. Yeah, I think I have found no evidence. I interviewed prisoners after the 2007 election and I found no evidence that there was this idea of a voting block. The idea that all prisoners would vote for one candidate, I think, is used by people who oppose enfranchisement. And again, it's used to try and say, well, they'll all vote for somebody who is anti-law or pro-criminal or, you know, use this uh, to try and frighten people off. What's interesting is that when I asked prisoners who they voted for, the largest party in the Republic of Ireland in the 2007 election was Fianna Fáil. The largest party amongst prisoners was Fianna Fáil. They reflected the demographic of people outside. And the idea, again, that politicians would go into prisons and see humanizes the experience for them but I think one of the things about facilitating prisoner voting is not only does it maintain a connection with prisoners inside to the outside, but yes, it should bring politicians in to see the conditions which their policies uh, manifest as such in the institution. And maybe it may not be the politician in question because as you point out, somebody may be in a constituency far from uh, a prison where an individual is located and during election time it's highly unlikely they're going to go up and see you know two or three voters but their political party could go in and engage and encourage people to vote along party lines for uh, their particular candidate and have that debate about policies have that debate about how we engage prisoners but that might also not only give the prisoners a connection with the outside but bring the outside into prison and see that at the end of the day, prisons are public institutions. They may be closed, but what goes on therein is done through po uh, penal policy decided by politicians, and that reflects the society that they're, they're part of. So what goes on in those institutions is done in the name of the citizens of each state, even if they're run by private uh, companies. So therefore, I think politicians going in and seeing how penal policy has actually impacted on a day-to-day -day basis, and whether it's effective, whether it works, whether it leads to, which is what the public good should be, people coming out of prison not committing crime again. That would be, I think, enrich a politician's understanding of the impact of their policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on yes. that point, Gail Ross. <laughs> that was my going, going to be my exact question, actually. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming in. I think a lot of it is actually being covered, the stuff that we were going to go over and covered very well. So, you know, thank you very much for your evidence. Um, the rehabilitation side, and um, Dr. Behan, exactly what you were just uh, touching on there at the moment. Do you have... Are there any statistics from um, from either uh, country about whether the introduction of allowing prisoners to vote has actually helped with the rehabilitation and the reoffending rates of prisoners? 
Okay. I think in terms of people uh, transforming their lives and not committing crime again, it's rarely one particular uh, element. There are many what the system scholars call hooks for change, and that can be maturation. It can be maybe somebody uh, intergenerativity, somebody having a stable relationship and maybe having a child, developing pro-social bonds, different communities outside, maybe getting a job, and feeling part of a community. So. I, don't, I haven't found evidence to say that the introduction of prisoner voting will actually lead to a, a lower recidivist rate. However, what I would say is that the introduction of prisoner voting sends a very powerful signal to prisoners, both symbolic and uh, in reality, by allowing them to participate, that their voice now is important and they're part, are part of the community. So I'm not so sure in and of itself it will reduce crime but I think it's part of a wider, as I said, this mosaic of citizenship where we try to reduce the dislocation and the disconnection between those we sent to prison by maintaining some contact outside. We had some um, evidence in a previous session and um, the trust issue was mentioned, that we're actually placing our trust now in these people to make these important decisions that are going to affect their lives, whether they continue on in prison or you know, outside their prison and their families' lives as well. Um, Emma, do you have any comment on that? Um, in terms of the trust element, no. But I did just want to add to what to, to your first question to say that when I was um, when I first reached out to the clerks to um, share the Canadian experience and then was invited to attend, what I did was reach out to Rick Sove, who is the Canadian prisoner that launched the legal challenge, because I wanted to ask him, you know, why'd you do it and what was the impact and. Um, we shared some emails back and forth, and what Rick did was he made this really interesting connection for me um, between, you know, the right to vote and responsibility. So that, you know, sentences are meant to remove people from society, not to take away their um, responsibilities as citizens. And the message that I was getting from Rick, which was uh, meaningful to me, was that disenfranchisement is more likely to become a self-fulfilling prophecy than a spur to reintegration. Um, so that depriving at-risk uh, individuals of their sense of collective identity, of their membership um, in the community is unlikely to instill um, a sense of responsibility uh, and community identity, whereas if you um, protect, promote, and respect that right to vote, um, you're more likely to teach uh, democratic values and social responsibility. And I know that committee has heard already from individuals with lived experience of the criminal justice system, but I would strongly encourage uh, reaching out to individuals who have uh, the experience of voting um, while being incarcerated and the impact that it has had. Right, I'm going to have, let Jamie come in first and then I'll come back to you. Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. And apologies to Dr. Ben for missing the opening part of your statement. Uh, but I have read through your submission. Um, I guess uh, one of the things I've been thinking about throughout this process is that if it is to happen in the UK, uh, that it is achieved not just through legislation, but also that we must take the people with us on this. And I'm intrigued uh, that in the example of the I Irish Republic, that there was less of a fuss, I guess, in the general public around it. And whether that was media-led or otherwise, it, it does strike me as, as a quite a big difference, it seems to be something in this country which is a, an issue of contention, I guess. Um, so my question really is, is how we perhaps tackle some of the uh, views or even misconceptions around what doing this would actually achieve. Um, and I guess I have two specific questions. I think one uh, you addressed around perceptions that there is a, a natural trend that prisoners will always vote against the government of the day because they are in prison, they're in custody, and they're maybe perhaps looking for someone to blame, and it's easy to blame the government of the day that put them in that place in the first place. But your evidence suggests that's maybe not the case. Um, but in the example of Fianna Fáil winning that election, was that a government change anyway? So in that sense, they were voting with wider society against an incumbent government. No, it was uh, Fianna Fáil had been in power, and then they were returned to power in 1997. Uh, that puts that myth to bed quite, yeah. quite easily. 
Um, and I guess the other one is around uh, perhaps the example uh, of what happens in Canada, where the vote, uh, where the prisoner votes in their uh, home constituency or riding, uh, as would likely be the case uh, here. Um, how do we combat the perception that if someone is removed from that community, and this goes back to the philosophical question around whether they should have the vote, I guess, or not, how do we combat the, uh, uh, the, the opinion that if someone is removed from that community that they should not have a say on the elected members that are governing those communities of which they're no longer part of in a physical sense, so MPs, councillors, members of the Scottish Parliament and so on. Uh, and I, I guess I, I ask that not just in a philosophical way but in a, a practical way if those prisons are in long custodial sentences which are far beyond the electoral cycles of the election that they're voting and they will not be participating in those communities of which they are electing members, which is actually the point of election, is to elect your local member, not just the government. Um, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier that, um, you know, your removal from society doesn't automatically um, result in taking away your responsibilities as a citizen. and. And I think the way you're phrasing it is very focused on the individual voter, but that individual voter we call um, prisoners, um, they still have family uh, that live in those communities. They um, still have friends that live in those communities. And it goes back to that sense of responsibility and wanting to instill in prisoners that sense of responsibility and wanting to maintain it so that when they do come back into society um, that they're not essentially starting from scratch, but that they're um, still participating in the communities where they came from. They're still caring about the individuals and, um, who are their family members and friends. Do you have anything to add? I suppose just to say, just come back to the idea about the objective of imprisonment. And if we use imprisonment as the denial of liberty, or if we use prison for punishment. So in the US, there's much debate about what's called uh, individual or uh, collateral consequences of imprisonment are invisible punishments. So the denial of liberty begins the punishment, but that there are other punishments uh, uh, beyond the denial of liberty. So if we go down that road, then we say that we uh, take away not just an individual's liberty, but taking away their right to vote is another layer of punishment above and beyond uh, their denial of liberty. I would say one other thing is that in terms of the longitudinal um, consequences, most young people or most people who end up in prison are at a young age initially. And if we encourage in them a, a, a tradition of voting at an early age, then it does have longitudinal uh, consequences in encouraging them to do that outside. So using prison again as a place to engender uh, kind of, I suppose, democratic education can actually, uh, can actually be important. Final point on that is just one of the, so if the uh, experience of imprisonment in Scotland is similar to Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland there are some constituencies where there is a much greater uh, number of people in prison from particular constituencies, a disproportionate number from various electoral districts. And the impact that that may have in terms of building communities, which I think should be, you know, as an objective of all uh, political leadership, is building resilient communities. If a number of those are taken out of voting at a particular point in time, that it can actually weaken the bonds of community where people are encouraged to participate, not just in their community, but in the democratic process. I, I find that very fascinating, actually. Um, the idea that it's not just about the person as an individual not being able to vote, it's about the fact that they come from communities where they have neighbours, families, colleagues, children, parents, and so on. And that the decision they make and who will represent that area uh, is a decision that will uh, affect the people uh, that they're still connected to uh, and, and will be connected to when they leave custody. So I think that's uh, perhaps a side of the argument I hadn't uh, appreciated before. So thank you for that evidence.
Okay, um, we should also be quite clear, actually, that the argument about whether we should do this is won or lost, depending on what side you're on. Uh, the instruction now is we have to do it, so we have to look at ways and how, how, how we can do that. So hopefully we can uh, investigate some of that. David, well, did you want a supplementary on Jamie's point? Sure. So if you can come in on your supplementary, and then I've got Mary next. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, we've mentioned before about the role that media played in, in 2002 in 2006, when it both came into uh, prisoners were allowed to vote, there was no real big social media in these areas. Um, how could we lessen the role of social media or, or get over to people who use it? Because it's very effective at going against people and inflaming a situation very, very fast. And the things like prisoner voting would be stirred up by it. Or the opposite, yes. How can we engage with them? Are there any examples anywhere <coughs> you can give us? Because social media is now a way for news rather than newspapers. <laughs> I think he'll come back to political engagement and political leadership. I mean, as I say, newspapers and media have their own perspectives. Social media obviously can create a major storm around a particular issue at a particular moment in time. But partly, I think the way to do it is to look at this is an electoral reform, and Scotland showed the way in the independence referendum when it enfranchised 16 and 17 year olds. And I think the rest of the United Kingdom was looking at awe in the engagement of the populace in Scotland around the debates on the Scottish referendum. So I think if we look at something like this, how do we encourage people to participate as widely as possible in their community? And for a period of time, prisoners are in a community. I think one of the ways is by, unfortunately, when people are sent to prison, they're excluded from society. And there's this idea that we don't need to worry about them because they're cut off in the rest of society. If we, as I say, I would encourage, if I may be so bold, to suggest that the committee might go into a prison, speak to prisoners about their perspectives, ask them what they actually think, because I think it would enrich your deliberations, and certainly you would get a unique perspective from those who it affects most prisoners. But then you bring that uh, debates back to the community, back to your local areas, and humanize the people that we sent to prison, because many times they can be stigmatized, they, they can be othered, and they can be excluded. And the vast majority of prisoners in this jurisdiction, in the, throughout the United Kingdom and in Ireland, will be released one day. And how they're treated inside will have an impact on how they act outside. So I think it's a wider debate than just about prisoners and voting. It's about our treatment of people who we incarcerate and how we label them, how we deal with them, or how we are going to encourage them. And I think it comes around to this idea of bringing the prisoners out by in encouraging them in wider elements of civic engagement but also bringing the community in to see that these people, as uh, Jamie Green has said, you know, their parents, their children, they have uh, communities that they're part of. And interestingly, a point you made uh, uh, there about their concerns. In the research I did, the, uh, the, I asked about what's the most important political issue in Ireland today, and they said the health service. It was exactly the same as the community outside. The community outside might think it's, oh, well, sentencing or the criminal justice system or penal policy. It wasn't. It isn't. They had the same concerns as their communities outside about a health service, etc. Really interesting, yeah. Okay, David? Yep. Yeah. Mary Fee. <coughs> and it's, it's just a, a kind of very brief question. In, in some countries that, that allow um, prisoner voting, there is a ban or a partial ban, depending on length of sentence or, or type of crime. And, and the debate in this country has, to a degree, been very much focused on if you allow a prisoner to vote, is it every prisoner, is it what sentence, what type of crime? Do you think it's a hindrance to put the focus of the discussion on type of crime and length of sentence? And we should have a principled discussion about should prisoners be allowed to vote, and that should be our starting point? <coughs> um, well, I, of course, have my prejudices on this subject, um, which are probably obvious. But uh, yes, 
uh, in answer to your question. When I was getting ready to appear today, I went and I read some of the transcripts from um, the Westminster Committee that in 2013 studied the, what was it called, the Voting Prisoners Eligibility Bill, and those exact questions were coming up. Should we do this on sentence length, offense category? And they had experts, um, one who I greatly admired, Julian Roberts, who's a sentencing expert um, at Oxford, who tackled some of those questions. and. Um, what Dr. Roberts came out with was that neither is really a good solution to the issue because it ignores the wider question of what is the purpose of this, you know, what is the goal? Um, and I think if you look at the Canadian experience, it's been pretty clear that um, the arguments that support the ban just don't stand up. You know, it's a constitutional right um, and the denial of a constitutional right without any limitation um, just was found to infringe on prisoners' fundamental rights. Mm. Dr. Bean. I think if the debate could get sidetracked into uh, individualizing a particular crime or concentrating on a particular individual, so for example, a newspaper on social media or whatever, it could turn into, will you allow X to vote even though they've committed Y crimes plus, etc. And I would argue that regardless of crime or sentence, people have a part of the, people are part of the community and they should participate in that uh, community through voting. So I think if you start going down the sentence and the, uh, uh, crime route, it will, I think, take away from the, the discussions about treatment of prisoners, civic engagement, uh, participation, etc., and into, because some people might want to individualise it, would you allow X or Y to vote? And then you begin getting sidetracked into that instead of saying, uh, should we allow votes to prisoners, and this is the way we're actually going to do it. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. Um, Alex. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm really struck by and indeed frustrated by the very arbitrary nature of the deni denial of the right to vote for, for Scottish prisoners. For example, if you'd started a prison sentence in a Scottish prison on the 9th of June 2014 for three years, then you would have missed nine elections and referenda. If you were to start a three-year sentence on the 9th of June 2017, you're likely not to miss a single one. And that would go for, if you uh, individualise the kind of sentence that, for which the right of vote was removed, you could still have exactly the same situation for that crime, say it was political dishonesty, um, you would serve three years and miss nine elections in that period, but not a single one in the next period. So uh, that's just a reflection on that point. Um, my question comes back again to uh, public opinion and, and this barrier we certainly have um, in where there may be some unified political will in Scotland to make this happen, but that is not reflected in public opinion. It comes back to that age-old question, should public policy follow public opinion or lead it? And I always use it, this isn't the exact same thing, it's a different issue, but in Belgium when they brought in the end to physical punishment of children, it was against an 80% resistance from the public, which after 18 months of the ban coming in had completely turned around to 80% support. Are you both from jurisdictions which do you think are politically more disposed to leading public opinion rather than following it? Um, and can you give us other examples of where that's potentially the case if you think that's true? Wow. <laughs> um, I think if you had gone out and asked uh, Canadians, you know, should all prisoners have the right to vote, I think you would have had, you know, the majority come back and say no. But I think because of the court decision, um, and what they had to say in terms of the goals, um, the purpose of punishment, you know, and whether governments have a right to deny you a constitutional freedom outright um, without any limitation, that that has really changed public opinion on the prisoners' right to vote. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I do think that, that the policy has shifted um, perceptions in Canada in terms of prisoners' is right to vote. I mean, now it's news, but it's not nasty news. It's not, you don't see headlines like, why are they voting, you know, take it away. Um, it's very much just, oh yeah, we've got prisoners and they're voting today. <laughs>
Dr. Brown? I think similar to Emma and what happened in Canada, the odd time that you do see this discussion in newspapers coming up to elections when you know, there's all sorts of political coverage and this is a kind of, you know, different angle. They might go to prisons. It is obviously as a postal vote, it's uh, prisoners cast their ballot maybe a week, 10 days beforehand. And there is a report on how it went in the prisons, the numbers who are actually voting, etc., rather than a debate about whether prisoners should have the, uh, have the right to vote. At the time, there was no... Uh, opinion poll, for example, held outside as to whether the general public thinks that prisoners should have the right to vote. When I undertook research on this uh, in 2006 for a number of years, when I spoke to people about it, they were saying, well, do prisoners have the right to vote? There was people were not very knowledgeable about whether they did or they didn't. And I think that comes back to probably we don't tend to know a huge amount of what goes on within our penal institutions in general as a populace, because if we can exclude the people by sending in there it gives the impression that they're out of sight, out of mind for, for a period of time. I suppose I would consider it incumbent on whether it's political leaders, leaders of civic society, influencers in terms of how we uh, engage people, whether it's the business community, to try and create a different approach towards prisoners because I think that's where it comes back to. And I think people also have to take I suppose a bit of political and leadership responsibility to say, if we think it's a good idea and we believe that prisoners should have the right to vote, then we lead by challenging people with perceptions and negative stereotypes about those that we sent to prison. That may not always be popular in terms of uh, political return, but certainly it didn't seem to damage any politicians uh, popularity, there may have been other reasons why they weren't returned to power, but I don't think, I didn't find any evidence to suggest that their voting record on whether prisoners should have the right had an impact on their electoral outcome. Um, one final small follow-up, if I may convene it, just in terms of um, existing opposition within your jurisdictions, um, we often think of victims' organisations uh, as being certainly um, people who have more, most to say against uh, prisoner voting. Um, have the victims' organisations in your countries played much of a role in this process? No. no. In terms of coming out against it, yeah. I would say no. Okay. Yeah. No, it's the same in Republic of Ireland. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just, just quickly, a quick follow-up before I come back, come back to Jamie. We, we talked about uh, whether we do this on the length of sentence or uh, the crime committed. Um, and I'm going to just throw this one out. If the person was convicted of a crime of electoral fraud, for instance, or political dishonesty, uh, is that uh, was there any discussion around about whether that type of person should be denied the right to, to vote uh, just because of the nature of the crime? No? Uh, well, when Quebec uh, in 1979 decided to allow its provincial prisoners to vote, they did say, you know, this, they didn't apply it to prisoners who had um, violated the Elections Act. But again, I would go back to the many court decisions on this that have said that any ban on prisoner voting is unconstitutional, um, that um, it falls outside the remit of Parliament to add the voting ban as part of their um, package of punishment options, if you will. Dr. Behan? Similarly, I can understand why people would say that the punishment should fit the crime. So if the crime is something which undermines the democratic process, then an individual shouldn't participate in that. But you could say that all crime undermines the democratic polity and the kind of social uh, compact that binds us together. And I suppose it comes back to the idea, I think, of when we look at this and when other jurisdictions look at it, they mo a lot of time talk about the social contract and whether the social contract has been undermined by somebody committing a crime. What I try to look at is the social compact. Instead of looking at it in a negative way, of somebody breaking the social contract, let's look at how the social compact binds us together as a community and how we can build more resilient communities where we work together. And therefore, one crime or another, I don't think is appropriate to uh, eliminate an individual who's committed that from voting. Thank you, Thank you very much. Jimmy Green.
the convener stole my thunder. I was, my, my question was very similar in nature, but I'll, I'll ask it perhaps in a different way. Um, uh, get the same answer, yes. Um, and I, 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 perhaps at the minute, I, I probably missed declarations of interest. I should have stated that I am a Canadian citizen and I'm probably very proud of what Canada has achieved in this respect, so uh, I should put that on record. Um, uh, is anyone in the panel where, in any of the countries or jurisdictions where prisoner voting is uh, occurs, are there any known exemptions to that? And, and I think the example of electoral fraud is an interesting one, because if someone has, uh, in, in, the, in the wider public, uh, committed some form of electoral fraud or tried to perverse the course of, of electoral processes and is subsequently sent to prison, as a direct result of that crime alone. Um, doesn't it seem odd, perhaps, that one would argue that they should then have the right to vote whilst that sentence has been played out and not when they come out of custody? And I guess I don't want to bring it back to the sentence versus crime argument because I think you either do it or you don't, but is there any circumstances where it is appropriate to have exemptions for certain crimes? Um, and I guess uh, the other question is, if uh, you were to run a poll in Ireland or Canada <coughs> to state that the government of the day had a proposal to remove prisoner voting, that perhaps public would, would be up in arms <coughs> about that uh, and say, actually, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, they've got the right at the moment. Why would you take it away? So, in fact, that because the government's moved in that direction, they've taken the public with them and, and perceptions have actually shifted over the last decades or so. Okay, I suppose first there is that argument that somebody, if they've committed a crime which directly relates to the activity that you're going to prevent them. So there are some states where, for example, treason is considered a crime serious enough to deny somebody the right to vote, challenging the authority of the state or uh, uh, electoral fraud. I suppose if we, one of the possibly most acute examples of where this uh, was brought to the fore was in 1995 Yitzhak Rabin was killed uh, as he was coming away from a peace rally in Jerusalem by a man called Yigal Amir and six months later during the Israeli elections the man who <coughs> killed uh, Yitzhak Rabin as the Prime Minister of Israel the representative of the people of Israel was actually allowed vote in the uh, election to his successor. It was brought to the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court says, by actually denying him the right to vote, undermines not just his right, but the rights of all uh, the community and the part of uh, the democratic polity. So I suppose you couldn't get a more, I suppose, uh, ac acute example of somebody undermining the democratic process and uh, still being part of that uh, as a result afterwards. Mm. You're speechless, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was, I'm repeating your question, unfortunately. I, my, my second point was around public uh, perceptions, and I wondered if you were I'm not asking to preempt what one of these polls would result in, but uh, if there was a proposal to take prisoner votes away, that actually you would may find that perceptions had gone from negative to positive. That comes back to the point that should politicians lead the conversation rather than react to what's pop popular in the public domain? I'm not, I'm not sure of the question. Is it that you want us to try and guess <coughs> what the Canadian population would think if the government came out tomorrow and said, no more voting for president? Exactly. <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. To uh, surmise for an entire nation. <laughs> <laughs> I do, and I think, uh, and I mean, I just don't think this government today would do that. But um, if they did, you know, my sincere hope would be that Canadians would stand up and go, I'm sorry, the government just doesn't have the right to decide to deny constitutional rights outright. Um, they can certainly limit them. Um, if that's justified, but to deny it outright, I, I hope would anger Canadians. Yeah. What I'm saying is uh, that it seems a big issue at the time because it's it's a change. But once that change is, is, has occurred decades down the line, it's just not thought about or discussed anymore. It becomes a non-issue, in effect. Hopefully. Hey, Jimmy. 
last very right. quick supplementary very quick question. Question. I should declare the same interest as Jamie that I too am a Canadian citizen but um, in just keen to hear how your jurisdictions respond to extending the franchise in other areas um, so for example we've battled for years and years and made quite a significant degree of progress e of extending the franchise to 16 year olds so for young people in particular is this a frontier that you guys have pushed back in both Canada and the Republic of Ireland Never, that, that's not something that's come up. When I first moved to Scotland, I was you know, really surprised that the franchise had been extended to 16-year-olds. Um, I will say that it, it was really during the 1980s where we, and up to 2002, where the franchise was extended. Um, so it was extended first to federal judges um, and then to prisoners, um, but not to, not to young voters, no. So it's still 18 in Canada? It's is that still right? 18 in yeah. Canada. And in the Republic? I suppose in the Republic of Ireland, I would say it's more around the uh, practicalities of voting rather than the actual extending the uh, franchise. So, for example, how do we encourage hard-to-reach groups to participate in the uh, uh, electoral process? And there's the National Association, the National Adult Literacy Association, produce leaflets to uh, in kind of accessible language for those who may have literacy difficulties. When do we had a lot, of, a lot of new arrivals in Ireland in 2004, uh, when the European and local elections were taking place, the Department of Environment had uh, information in Polish and Romanian languages to try and encourage them because they had a right to vote in local and European elections. Uh, I think it was in the 1990s, photographs were uh, introduced on ballot papers in the Republic of Ireland. So I think it's about how to uh, uh, embrace the hard to reach groups rather than extending the franchise, which I think if prisoners are enfranchised here, they, I think, do become part of a hard to reach group and therefore there probably would need to be uh, special measures to try and encourage them and engage with them. And I suppose move beyond the idea of a legal concept of enfranchisement to use it as engagement and empowerment. And again, it comes back to how we encourage that kind of civic engagement amongst prisoners. And what's the age of franchise in Ireland? It's 18. 18 as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've exhausted our <coughs> questions this morning. Um, it just leaves it up to me to say, uh, give our grateful thanks from the committee for your evidence, both written and uh, verbal this morning. It's been incredibly interesting. It's certainly informed our uh, process going forward. And I think we'll have a discussion uh, about whether we should be going to visit a prison too. So that was a great uh, recommendation on, on your behalf. But uh, we're grateful and thank you so much for your evidence this morning. And as we move into agenda item two, we are moving in to private session. I'm suspending the meeting, yeah.